Thank you so much for joining us for this week's service. Now, if you wanted to partner with us, even as we're getting started right now, one of the easiest ways that you can do that is actually by sharing the service. Whether you're watching live or you're watching it in a restream, one of the easiest things you can do is actually just forward it to somebody else who you'd wanna maybe encourage or inspire, or maybe send it to a group of people that you can be watching together. So good, and we also would love for you to download the East Lake Church app, because on the app, you can follow along with mm -hmm. the message notes. There's even lyrics to the worship song, so you can sing to the top of your lungs from wherever you're at. Yes. So make sure you download the East Lake Church app and select which campus you'd like to be associated with. That's uh, super good. Before we begin the service, why don't I pray for us and then we'll get uh, into worship. Jesus, thank you so much for providing a space where we can experience you uh, in real time. Lord, my prayer is that you would meet us now, Lord, that you would um, remind us of the promises of your character that are found in your word, Lord, that we'd be encouraged and inspired through worship, Lord, that we would be challenged as we walk through your scripture today. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's start the service. It's not a prison. 
power, like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. Again, so thankful that you are with us. If we haven't yet met, my name is Mingo. This is Nick. We both pastor here at Torrey Pines Church. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a look ahead as to what's to come. The first is going to be our new series called Empty and Filled. It's actually a walk through the Lent journey as we make our way to Easter. Easter being one of the largest kind of hallmarks in Christendom. It's like our Super Bowl of our faith. And uh, the way that we're going to get there together is going to be through the vehicle of small groups. Now, growth groups and small groups are something that we have had in place here at Torrey Pines Church since I've gotten here. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to actually be ramping up those groups. We're going to be giving you a chance to belong to one, to maybe sign up for one or maybe even lead one. Um, and the way that you can do that, really simply, you can actually go to the app and you can actually search the different groups that are available. We were just in my office this week and we have a ton of them uh, that are coming to uh, the surface this season. Uh, in addition to the app, if you're with us in person, you can actually just email us info at torypines.church and one of our staff members will get back to you with a roster of all the available growth groups this season. And here's the cool part about it. We've actually got them happening nearly every day of the week. So good. Speaking of groups, the youth group is actually going to be regathering again coming up here really soon. Actually, on Wednesday, the 10th of this month at 6 p.m., uh, we're going to be regathering as a student ministry outside mm. on our lawn. Uh, there's going to be fire pits. There's going to be a s'mores after party games, just the vibes and hang out for high school and middle school students. So we would love for your student to be a part of that. Uh, we're going to be practicing all the safe things outside, and it's just going to be a wonderful time. So uh, that's our invitation. Every Wednesday at 6 p.m. starting on the 10th, we'll have stuff for students. Yeah, what I love about that is it gives parents a chance to send their students into something that's well programmed and well thought through. We've been anticipating relaunching this program, and I hope that you spread the word. If you know somebody who's got a student in that age range, or if you've got kids in that age range, you just kind of give them that friendly here you go. Yep. Check him out. <laughs> uh, listen, the spaces that we are developing right now at Torrey Pines Church are happening because of your generosity. Mm -hmm. The ongoing collective generosity of our church is something that has made us, I think, stand above uh, in this season. It's made us stand out to our community, whether it's a partnership with the San Diego Blood Drive, or I'm sorry, the San Diego Red Cross or mm -hmm. the San Diego Food um, Bank. Any of those like partnerships in addition to serving frontline workers or just taking care of family members or community that's connected to our church family members, it all happens because of your generosity. So 
One, I want to say thank you. And two, I want to invite you, if you're ready to participate in that generosity, it's really simple. You can still use your phone again. You can text generosity to 67076. You can go through the app. You can give there. Or you can go onto our church's website, torypines.church, and you can click through the prompts there, and you can join us and the rest of the Torrey Pines family in generosity this week. I believe we also have communion today. Yeah, that's we, right. We're going to be doing communion today. So from wherever you're at, find the elements, mm -hmm. whether it's juice, crackers, coffee. You <laughs> yep. can use anything for communion today. because We'd love for you to participate in that with us. Definitely. Uh, today, we're going to be jumping back into our series of Jesus over everything. And uh, I'm excited about this because we got Pastor Mingo giving the message today. So let's jump into this. When Bravery, my oldest son, was about four years old, I bought him arguably the best present he could have ever owned in his lifetime. I bought him an OG original slip and slide. And when I bought the slip and slide, I got it in the box, I rolled it out, I pumped up the reality of the kind of fun that my kid was gonna be able to have once we got this thing out and ready. And it's crazy when you're a kid, you remember things much different than when you revisit them in your adult life. I remember the slip and slide being about 248 feet worth of slide. I remember it being like 10 feet wide. Me and nine friends could go sliding down all together. And then when I unpacked this new slip and slide that I bought for Bravery, it was about 11 feet long, roughly about the length of my body with my hand stretched high. And it was just wide enough for my body, my adult body to slide down. Nonetheless, I wasn't gonna let my disappointment become his disappointment. So I kept the energy high, I soaped it down, and we started running down the slip and slide during the afternoon. And Bravery loved it as a kid. I remember that uh, we ran it all morning long and then when it came time to break for lunch, I turned everything off, I turned off the sprinklers, Everything kind of dried out because it was a hot day. We ate lunch and then Bravery in all of his excitement went running out before I could get it wet and soapy again and with a full blown dive, uh, jumped onto the slip and slide bone dry and did the classic like legs over the head shoulder scorpion in a way that was like fit for YouTube gold. When I saw it, first uh, I laughed hard because it was so funny, but then I just felt this deep sweeping emotion of like guilt uh, that came over me because I wasn't able to protect my kid uh, from something that he didn't know. It was something that he ran into thinking that it just is always the same. And for whatever reason, I just remember him getting up and crying and kind of wandering over to me, wondering what was going on. And the effect for him, he actually looked like he experienced like a single portion of embarrassment with a second portion of like shame because he thought that he should have done it better. And then for me, I just felt all of this guilt as a dad because I wasn't able to protect my kid on something as dumb as a slip and slide. And today, as we get into the conversation, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is over that feeling of guilt. And for bravery, Jesus is over that feeling of shame or embarrassment. Uh, and I think it's such a, a, an appropriate conversation for us to have uh, in this season because everything that we go through as human beings, as flawed human beings, uh, we can react in ways, whether something's been done to us or whether we've done something inadvertently in our, our uh, close past or maybe it's something that happened years ago. Shame and guilt are these things that erode in us uh, in a way that God never intended. And so I want to get into scripture today. I want to remind us through the promises that we have in the Bible about how God never intended for people like you and for me, Jesus people, to hold and to carry shame and guilt. 
as we get into this, I actually want to remind everybody watching today about the verse that we have uh, clung on to for 2021. Our verse of the year is uh, out of Colossians 1, 17 and 18. And it says this as a reminder. It says, He, Jesus, existed before anything was made. And now everything finds its completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. He is the most exalted one, holding the first place in everything. We've determined as a church and as a church network and family that our phrase for the year would be Jesus over everything, whether it's our future or our past, our fears or our accomplishments, uh, what, it's, what we endeavor to do or what we fail miserably at trying to do, uh, we've determined that we are going to declare Jesus over everything. In the last couple of weeks, we've talked about all the ways that he can be over the particular things in our life, but this one might be the hardest to declare him over. The reason being is uh, we have a real enemy who works to convince us of a false truth, which is to hold on to our guilt and our shame. And God, quite frankly, never designed our lives to hold or to make space for those two things in our life. I want to uh, bring to light an idea about what guilt and shame say about us uh, in our inner narrative. And tell me if you relate to this. I think that guilt says uh, that I did something bad, right? That's a way that we could define guilt. It's when we feel like or when we understand in our mind that we did something bad. I can remember feeling guilty as a kid uh, for stealing stuff or for mistreating my younger brothers uh, because I knew in me that I had done something that was not in alignment with the character that my parents raised me to reflect. Um, when we understand that we do something bad, that idea of guilt, actually in our conscious, uh, if you think of the way like the dash lights on your car light up with a warning, that's the way guilt kind of flashes in our souls, right? I know something wasn't right and I feel it for some reason. Nobody has to tell you, nobody has to point it out to you. I think internally you feel something and that can be used as a warning sign, but it shouldn't be consumed and it shouldn't be compartmentalized and packed away uh, because then it starts to erode at what God's good work could do through that feeling. So that's guilt. The second thing uh, that I think helps us understand guilt, especially when we experience it, is the way that the authors in the scriptures uh, kind of write about their own guilt. If you go to uh, Psalm chapter 32, verse 5, David, the author of many of the Psalms, uh, he writes in reflection of his own guilt. Look at what he says. He says, then I just let it all out. I said, I'll come clean about my failures to God. Suddenly the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. I love that he speaks to guilt and he actually has this remedy. He has this antidote to the guilt that he's feeling. And he says, he just let it all out. I imagine like a huge canister of liquid sitting and just getting knocked over and everything flowing out. It wasn't a confession to somebody else. Uh, David reports or he records that he let it out all to God. He just said what was on his mind. He just revealed or uncovered the guilt. He specified what he was feeling. And the Bible says as he wrote that suddenly that pressure that he was feeling was gone. So I think there's something that we can draft out of this when it comes to guilt. But first I want to address the idea of shame. If guilt says, I did something wrong, shame says, I am something wrong. Or, I am bad, right? And this is very important to draw the unique distinctions between because we're going to address both of them uh, through the remainder of this conversation. Guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am something bad. Guilt says, I did something wrong. Uh, shame says, I am, something is critically wrong with me. 
And scripture is going to help us navigate that. And actually, we're going to see how Jesus, he is over any amount of shame or any amount of guilt that we can carry on our own. And we're going to actually see how he sets us free. If we get into the mechanics of guilt and shame, I think that there are really two sources that lead us into becoming captive uh, to the ideas of the notions of guilt and shame. And there are two things. Uh, the first is the things that I've done, right? The things that you've done that you can recollect, that you can recall in your memory. Uh, sometimes there are certain things that you've done that are actually, they've left like scars or like marks in your mind. Maybe they've left physical scars or marks in your mind. The things that you've engaged with or maybe the things that happened to you uh, that would cause guilt or that would have you hold shame. That would be the first source of guilt and shame. David continues to write about it in Psalm 38, verse 3 and 4. Uh, this, he says, there is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. It's interesting that he continues to parallel the idea of guilt with weight that he carries. And it's beyond, it's excruciating beyond, I think, even physical weight. He's saying, this is the kind of stuff that feels like it's crushing my soul. And I don't think that his guilt uh, is much different than some of the guilt that we experience here, no matter what it may be. For some, it can be uh, unfaithfulness in relationships. It can be the guilt that's associated with being a parent that blows up on your kids because you're stressed out uh, from not being able to send them to school or not being able to give them kind of that regular childhood that they were experiencing less than a year ago. Maybe guilt comes because your parents or relatives have uh, built an expectation of how you ought to live and it's nearly impossible for you to actually achieve the things that they've designed or they've destined for you to live out. I don't know what causes your guilt, but I love that in scripture, there are real people who write real responses to how they surrender it over to God. And David in Psalm 38 says, so simply, there is no soundness in my bones because of this. So if it's wrapped around the things I've done, and maybe that's the source of your guilt or your shame. There's also another avenue. And this one I think is actually even more impactful. It's even more devastating. It's the lies that I've believed. And sometimes these work in pairing. Sometimes they're exclusive from one another. But I think it's important. John chapter 8 verse 44 reminds us of who it is that casts these lies out to us that we so easily grab a hold of. It says this, the devil was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This thing says basically the word lies like 28 times so that you know exactly what his motive and what exactly is his desire. He wants you to believe lies. The Bible says that when he lies, now he is sending lies out on a regular basis, nonstop. That is what he has become. The question is, are you on the receiving end of those lies, of those false truths when it comes to your shame and your guilt? And unfortunately, because we are all human, we all hold inadvertently these beliefs that aren't true about us. The beauty of uh, scripture is that you only have to go digging for the promises and for the character of God to be uh, in this great resurrection or this great relief to know that God actually has a plan to deal with your guilt. That he's never intended for you to hold shame as a core uh, component of your character. The Bible says he comes to set us free, that his yoke is light, that his burdens are our light. And so what do we need to know specifically in scripture about God's promises when, it's, when it comes to him being over guilt and shame in our lives? Well, I think there's one of two things that we can do, and they have very different outcomes when it comes to our reaction to guilt and shame. And this is what they are. You can either find yourself uh, in a place where you confess those guilty things that you're holding or that shame that you're holding or you can conceal right you can hide it 
or you can bring it to life. I read earlier in Psalms that David says that he just blurted it out. He finally just put it all out there, right? And that's the Old Testament. But then we've got this New Testament example of how Jesus deals with someone's total confession. They just bring out into the light the stuff that they're holding that they feel guilty about. But I want to tell you what actually happens when we find ourselves um, concealing our wounds, when we conceal shame or when we conceal our guilt. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. It's a huge warning, right? If you're going to conceal something that needs healing, that needs to be mended, that needs to be made right, if you choose just to conceal it, scripture says, Whatever you're trying to accomplish to do good, whatever that is, you actually will have a hard time prospering. It says, but the one who confesses and renounces their sin finds mercy. And what a promise to confess your sin, just to say, God, I know this isn't right. Even if it's something that happened decades ago, maybe it happened in your childhood, maybe something happened in your childhood That wasn't even your fault. The Bible says that even as you utter it to God, that there is a release, there is a weight that is lifted off of your spirit because you are now engaged in a conversation about a real wound that you have with your maker. As we reveal it, as we bring it to the surface, that's the place that God can now do that restorative work in our lives when it comes to the damage that's been done through shame and through Uh, guilt. So that's what happens when we conceal it. But here's the flip side of it, right? If we find ourselves in a position where we're actually able to confess it, that is actually speak to those wounds, speak to those hurts, speak to those fears. The Bible's got great promises laid up for people who actually step, even with a little bit of faith, towards revealing it. It says this in John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just, and he'll forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Maybe the thing that you're holding on to is something that's very insignificant in your past, but you just feel like you've got to get it out there. Jesus says, one, I love you a whole lot. Nothing that you could do or have done, nothing that you will do, Uh, is ever going to separate the amount of love that I have for you. There's no way you can diminish it. And I love that scripture says, if we just come out and say it, Lord, I, I've really messed up here. Or there was a season when I wasn't really proud of who it was uh, that I was being. Jesus is right there in the moment of confession. He is fully engaged. That's the promise we get out of John, John 1, 9. Uh, And then there's this opportunity to confess to one another, right? That's a vertical confession, me to God. And then there's this lateral confession that scripture speaks about that actually helps even restore your soul as you're speaking these things uh, in real time. It says in James 5, 6, I'm sorry, James 5, 16, it says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed, right? The process of healing comes from this open communication between you and another person. Now there's some caveats here. I would say there's some wisdom to be had in this uh, portion of how we confess uh, our shame and our guilt. You want to make sure that the person you're confessing to is a mature person. You're going to want to make sure that the person that you're confessing to is somebody who can handle and who can manage what it is that you're going to be confessing to them. I have a couple of very close friends in my life, right? My wife is one. That's my spouse. Um, My very close best friends uh, who I do life and work with, those are the guys that I bring these kind of transparency moments uh, to. And oftentimes I feel even the shame of bringing that stuff to the surface, but I know that's a lie from the enemy. I know the enemy doesn't want me to speak openly about the things I wrestle with because he wants me to feel isolated, separated from the people God has put into my life. I don't want you to believe that lie. And I try desperately myself to fight that lie. And this 
commandment to confess my sin to one another, to pray for each other so that you can be healed is the way we experience a God-designed restoration of our past, of our present, and any of the things that would have disconnected us from the person that he intended you and I to be. Now, uh, that's James 5, 16. And then finally, Matthew 5, 20, it says this, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you're never going to enter the kingdom of God. It's this weird verse that talks about how it's like, um, he's like speaking, um, whatever the word is that it's like, it's not true. The word is sarcastically almost, right? He's saying, you've got to be better, gooder, than the people who are the religious elite who are at the temple all the time. He's, he's basically saying nobody can act and be as good as the people who pretend to be as good as those who are fakely being religious. He's like, I don't want you to be that way. He tells the religious elite, you've got to be like these people, empty, in order to experience the fullness of what I have to bring in the name of my father. He tells the people who are uh, disparaged and on uh, the margins, the people who have no ability to get into the temple because they're not clean, they're not welcome, they're not ceremonially, ceremoniously cleaned. I don't even know if that's a word. They're not clean by culture. They would have been kept out of the temple. And Jesus says, you know what? If you confess your sins, to God, if you confess your sins to one another, you don't need that place. He sets this whole place on its head. And he says, for these people who are trying to be religious and trying to show an external cleanliness, nobody can access uh, forgiveness. Nobody can attain a guilt-free or a shame-free life unless they uh, confess it to me. I am the only person who can free you from what you hold on yourself. So where does that leave us? I think there's one thing that we can do collectively from one example in scripture that will help you move forward from shame and guilt as we address it in this context. And that's simply this, to choose the way forward, right? Choose the way forward, not backwards, not pausing and waiting, but choose the way that God provides for you forward. Read with me in Luke 23, verse 33 and 34, and then 39 through 43. It's a story of Jesus in his final hours of his life. And we're going to see somebody who's feeling the weight physically, literally, of the shame and the guilt that he has carried as he is now in proximity to Jesus. And listen to what Jesus says and what he offers to him. It says this, when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. This is Jesus. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us. Prove it while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? He's having this real question with Jesus, literally hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He's saying, don't you have any fear? Don't you have fear in this moment? Because we don't know what's coming next. He said, we deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And he's, he's mentioning, he's referencing Jesus and then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, what would give Jesus the reason to promise this person eternity if in the moments before they're both going to die, Jesus knows this person's past. This person has already confessed. He said, I deserve to be on this cross. Jesus, you do not deserve to be on this cross. But I want you to, to see what Jesus sees in this moment. He has a honest confession from this man. He has somebody who's saying, God, you are who they say you are. You are who you say you are. I'm just saying have grace on my life. This guy had no chance at returning to a life and making better choices later. 
He was in the last hours of his life. And I love that Jesus takes him at face value with an honest request full of faith. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Where one is scoffing, the other is, he's asking honestly, are you afraid? Please don't leave me here alone. And Jesus says, today we're going to be together. We're going to be restored in a way that only my dad could do. This is going to take us into communion. There's this beauty in what communion represents. It is Jesus' declaration that he is going to restore all things through him only. And the Bible tells us that he got his closest friends together for one last meal before he would go to the cross. And he was foreshadowing what was going to happen. And he brings bread, something they would have had at that dinner. And he brings wine, something that they would have been drinking together at that dinner. And while they're eating, it's already in them, right? They've already had bread and they've already had wine. Jesus takes a moment and he says, this bread represents my body broken for the sins of many, right? That it will be broken. I will suffer so that you and your sins will be covered. And he breaks this bread apart and he passes it around and they all get more of it. And as they're eating the bread, he takes wine he takes a cup of wine and he, he says, this is my blood that will be poured out and it will cover the sins of many. And it, it represents the bloodshed that he would face on the cross. But the beauty in communion, understanding that Jesus' body was broken, that his blood was poured out, was that it wasn't done in vain. That Jesus knew in his death we would be afforded eternal life with him that in us receiving that grace as a gift when we live our life in response to that action his perfectly lived life his willingness to go to the cross to cover my sin and your sins and then his resurrection that in all of that when we believe with faith that he invites us to be forgiven to be restored and to be with him for eternity. Just the belief sets us in a new trajectory with an eternal life. My prayer is as we take this, maybe this is your first time ever understanding that God wants you to relinquish, to throw off shame, to throw off guilt. God doesn't say shame on you. He says shame off of you. And maybe for the first time you realize that God is for you, not against you. As we take the juice, let's soak in the idea that Jesus willingly took on our shame, takes on our guilt, and he responds with forgiveness. I want to read one more verse for you, and then we'll wrap up this conversation with a prayer. It comes from 1 Peter 2.24, and it says this, He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, I have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. I hope today you realize that Jesus loves you so much that he willingly took on all shame and all guilt so that you could experience freedom. Let me pray for us, and then we'll move on to the next part of the service. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking shame and guilt off of our hands. Thanks for exchanging it with freedom and joy and grace. God, would we step like a child, Lord? We don't understand it fully, but we need it completely, Lord, towards you. Lord, would you help us to throw off shame and throw off guilt in exchange for all that you have promised for us in scripture, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. So thankful for communion because it reminds us of what Jesus did for us, his sacrifice so that we could enjoy a relationship with him. Uh, today, if you need prayer, 
or you want to say yes to Jesus, it's super simple. Uh, we would love to reach out to you and be with you in that. So all you need to do is text New Start to 67076 and someone from our staff will reach out to you and have that conversation. Uh, before we leave today, we want to end with worship. So we ask you, join us in one more song.
God of revival.